This episode contains discussions of topics some listeners may find distressing or triggering. Shutter Stories, a canon podcast. Hi, I'm Ilvin Kitchin, a photojournalist and Canon ambassador, and welcome to the latest episode of Shutter Stories, a Canon podcast. In this episode, we are focusing on a rarely discussed topic, the trauma experienced by those who wield cameras as their tools of expression. Those individuals often have to immerse themselves in the raw and sometimes challenging realities of the world. From war to animal welfare advocacy, to intimate human stories, each click of the shutter can leave a mark on their psyche. Trauma and conflict will always be a part of the human condition. And for the sake of all of us, photojournalists must be there to document it. This does mean that encountering trauma in some form is inevitable and learning to cope with it is paramount. Joining me today are two people who know a great deal about this. Finbar O'Reilly and Dr. Anthony Feinstein, who have worked together and separately on the issues facing photojournalists working in conflict zones. Finbar is an award-winning photojournalist with more than 20 years experience. He co-wrote the joint memoir Shooting Ghost with US Marine Sergeant Thomas James Brennan about their experiences during the war in Afghanistan. Dr. Anthony Feinstein is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. His work relates to the study of journalists in conflict situations, and he has published a series of seminal studies exploring the psychological effects of conflicts on journalists. His new book, Moral Courage, is out now. We will be sharing coping mechanisms to help navigate the emotional aftermath of the trauma associated with some parts of this industry throughout the episode, so please listen all the way through. If, however, you are affected by any of the subject matter discussed on the show, we recommend reaching out to a qualified healthcare professional. Welcome, Finbar. Welcome, Anthony. Thanks so much for being here both. Hi, uh, thanks, Elvi. Yeah, very pleased to be here. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to this specific episode because it's an amazing, interesting topic. Also, from my experience as a photojournalist, it's linked to myself as well. So I'm very curious about today's episode. Would you mind introducing and kind of giving a bit of background? Anthony, let's start with you on this. A little bit about myself. I'm a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. I run a clinical practice and a research team. And one of my areas of research is how do journalists cope psychologically with frontline work and uh, confronting trauma? And I've been doing this now for over, over two decades. I got the idea behind shooting war when I was visiting Oklahoma to give a lecture and I was taken to the museum in Oklahoma City that deals with the bombing of the building, Timothy McVeigh's uh, terrorist act in, in Oklahoma City. And it's a very, very powerful, moving uh, museum. And I saw this remarkable photograph in this museum of a um, firefighter coming out of the wreckage of the building holding a, a bloodied infant. And it's one of these photographs yeah, that just arrests your, your attention. Wasn't that taken by an amateur photographer? It was. It was taken by a banker, Charles Porter. He was sitting in a nearby building. He was a wannabe photographer, but he was a banker. And when he heard the boom, he ran downstairs, and he was the very first person on the site of the of the bombing. And he always kept a camera with him, and he started to take these photographs. And uh, it was pre-digital. He, on the way home from work that day, he stopped off at a Walmart to have his photographs developed. It was one of these one-hour developments, you know? And there was this incredible photograph of this firefighter carrying this this infant. And I remember thinking, what you know, what effect does a image like this have on the person who takes a photograph? And you know, all the people involved in the photograph, the parents of the baby, the firefighter, how are they affected by this? And that became the genesis for my shooting war project. Wow. And that is now about twenty years ago, you said. So this is really a live topic. It is, yep. And Finbar, I would love to know also how the two of you know each other. Maybe you can talk a bit about that. Yes. Well, I'm an independent photojournalist. Uh, I've been, been working for a little over 20 years. And the first 10 or 15 years of that was based in West and Central Africa, working for a Newswire. And um, over the last few years, I've also worked in the Middle East and Europe. Uh, mostly covering conflict, but also humanitarian crises and various news events for different media outlets. 
And I know Anthony fairly well, largely through his work uh, with journalists and, and trauma and his book about, about this subject and his research into this subject. And we f first started talking in a therapeutic setting, actually, when I had spent a number of years working uh, across Africa and in a few other places, including Afghanistan, and was feeling that I needed some kind of psychological and emotional support from a professional to better understand the experiences and things that I was going through at that time. And I was steered toward Anthony and um, went to meet him at his uh, office in Toronto and started a discussion that has continued off and on over the years and uh, involved also participation in a film that he was producing uh, called Journalist Under Fire. So we've, we've discussed these issues around trauma, about resilience and how we manage and grow often from the experiences that we have as journalists and what that means to us in terms of our lives beyond our jobs. Yeah, I recognize a lot of what you're saying, especially in the trying to find help for the ways we have to cope with uh, the job that we do. And it's beautiful that you're speaking so openly about this, also that that is the way that you met each other. Anthony, could you maybe define trauma? Right. So, so trauma, a very simple definition of trauma is a, is a deeply distressing or disturbing personal experience. That's a broad definition of trauma. And most people over the course of their lifetime will confront a traumatic event like this or multiple traumatic events. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to translate into long-standing, enduring emotional distress. But the risk of confronting traumatic events of a very significant magnitude is that for some people, you can end up developing the typical trauma response, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. So PTSD um, is a mental illness, and it arises from being exposed to a very significant stressor, the kind of event that could have killed you or could have killed other people or did indeed kill other people. And then in response to that, you have to have symptoms that fall into four groups. The first is the re-experiencing or the intrusive uh, part, trauma in which you have flashbacks or nightmares or unwanted recollections, memories, smells, sounds. The second symptom group is avoidance. So in response to the trauma, you want to avoid recollections of it. You try and blot it out, distract yourself. You do not want to go back to the scene of the trauma. So that's the avoidance. The third symptom group refers to part of your nervous system called the autonomic nervous system, which becomes overactive. So you can't fall asleep, you cannot concentrate, any more irritable, and you have a very prominent startle response. And when you come back to a safe place, you still think you're under threat. So you're kind of looking over your shoulder, anticipating another trauma. And then the fourth symptom group is that your thoughts turn negative. Um, you start seeing the world in a darker or depressive way. The things that formerly gave you pleasure, you can't take the same pleasure from them because uh, you see things in a negative light. And to have the diagnosis of PTSD, you have to have symptoms from all four groups, from the intrusion we're experiencing, the avoidance, the arousal, and these negative thoughts. Plus, the final caveat is that these symptoms have to be present for a minimum of 28 days because there's a recollection that many people can have symptoms like this following a traumatic event, but they fade away quite quickly. If they don't, then you've got PTSD. And what, I'm just curious, like, let's say they, they fade away, but they come back. Would it then be PTSD? Absolutely. And there's a category called delayed onset PTSD in which the symptoms can be delayed by as much as six months before they come back and then cause a lot of distress. Thanks for explaining that, Anthony. With this job that Finbar is doing and that I'm doing in a certain way, although I don't do the frontline things that Finbar is, is doing, is trauma actually avoidable? As in, can you do this job without any trouble, like without getting any psychological issues? I, I think the answer is yes. Um, the kind of work that, that, that Finbar does, of course, is very dangerous. And so there's going to be a lot of exposure to traumatic events, the way I define trauma, you know, deeply distressing or disturbing personal experience. There'll be a lot of that. But that doesn't have to translate into, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder or into depression or an anxiety disorder. So the data that, that my group has collected now over a long period of time shows that you know, more than 80% of journalists will not develop full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder. But they can have some of the symptoms of PTSD without meeting the full syndromal diagnosis. And so they can be, you know, nightmares or unwanted recollections. But that by themselves doesn't constitute PTSD. That said, those isolated symptoms can 
by themselves be quite distressing as well. And so I think you know the message is that when you do this very dangerous but important work, you are opening yourself up to the possibility of developing something like post-traumatic stress disorder or depression, etc. But it's not invariable that you're going to get it. And Finbar, when you started this career, was this something that was on your mind in your first assignments or your first work, which must have been in Africa, right? You were going to Kinshasa, Congo first. Is that correct? Yeah, my first my first overseas posting was in Congo, and that has been a sprawling war for more than 20 years, and um, came after the Rwandan genocide of 1994. So uh, I was familiar with the concept of post-traumatic stress and was familiar with the term. I felt at the time that I was immune to it, to the idea of it. I felt quite comfortable working and operating in the setting that I found myself, even though those uh, environments were often quite challenging, quite difficult. There was something that drew me toward it. It felt important. Uh, I went there immediately after the 9-11 attacks on New York and Washington, and I was debating whether as a journalist trying to make my way on the international scene, whether I should be directing myself to another part of the world where that story was playing out. But instead, I decided to stay with Central Africa because I felt I would have something to contribute there in a way that I might not if I was going somewhere where everybody else was also working higher profile journalists for higher profile media outlets. I was familiar with this idea, but I wasn't thinking that it was something that could affect me, the stresses of the job in that sense, or the risks of the job. So Finbar, you thought you were immune. I kind of recognized that feeling with, so I've been doing this now for like 17 years. And in the first years, friends and family were asking me, how are you feeling when, you, when you're experiencing all that? And I used to always say, well, the camera is in between. <laughs> so I feel kind of a distance uh, sometimes between what I'm shooting and what I'm actually seeing if I wouldn't be looking through the camera. Later on, I, I realized that that camera in between actually doesn't do that much. Wh when did you first realize it was affecting you? Yeah, I think the camera as a, as a shield, if we want to call it that, is potentially a bit of a, a bit of a myth. I think, you know, when we're working, we're in the moment. We are concentrating on the job at hand. We are focused on the situation, on our own and the security of others around us in that moment if it's a, a dangerous environment. And so your adrenaline may be running, your, your dopamine levels might be high. And so you're operating at a heightened state, which is very stimulating. And what I have tended to find over the years is that you're not feeling, uh, well, you're feeling a certain degree of stress, a certain kind of stress in that moment. But the emotional impact or effect of that oftentimes comes afterwards when you're not dealing with the logistics or the immediacy of the moment. It may be that evening when you get back to your computer and you're looking through the images that you've taken, or even once you've come out of that setting completely and finished that assignment, are back at home and reviewing what happened and thinking about what happened. And and the things you saw or experienced or, or witnessed, um, that's when they tend to sink in. In terms of when I started to feel that I was having some difficulties or intrusive thoughts, it was after I'd been doing this kind of work for some time. And one of the analogies that um, is often used is this idea of a, a cup uh, filling up with these kinds of experiences that, that may be traumatic or may be difficult to to grapple with. And at a certain point, everything may seal, seem fine until that cup starts to spill over. So it's, accumul it's an accumulation of experiences over time. And I think it was probably around, you know, six or seven years into doing this kind of work. And particularly after an intensive period of time where I was feeling, um, you know, physically exhausted, but also fairly emotionally drained. And some colleagues had uh, been killed in the line of work. And so these things started to build up and you started to ask questions and and really wonder what this was. And I've, you know, I've never um, been diagnosed with PTSD, but I experienced other things where, as Anthony was describing, you, you have this feeling of looking at the world in a much more negative view. You get a, a negative kind of cognition around 
your outlook so your everything starts to look very bleak and, and gray instead of being able to see um a, 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 the more, you know what may be a more realistic view of the world you become much more pessimistic in your view sometimes even cynical and so this was my experience and then then i started to feel degrees of uh what anthony anthony would later um identify as as depression with regards to my experience and my whether it's wor all work related or or life related that was um an experience that emerged for me and so that's what i came to anthony with to to try and address and to try and resolve and the thing that i found extremely helpful right from our first session even though something like that can't be fixed there's no silver bullet to to resolve it but it was this understanding through our conversation that what i was feeling was completely normal it was a it was a, a normal human response to the kinds of things that i had experienced and or that i had witnessed and so that was a very comforting thing and i think that's the kind of thing that i try to share with my colleagues and my peers who may come to me with these kinds of conversations around their own experiences and it's a question of validating those experiences and the ways that they're feeling and then discussing possible ways to manage those things do you have the feeling that this has changed this kind of open dialogue about this topic has that changed in in more recent years or? yes i think it's changed a lot actually it um particularly in you know countries like canada the united states england um when i started to do this work uh, back in 1999 there was nothing written on it uh, there wasn't a single publication on the topic of journalism and trauma and emotional responses and news organizations weren't even aware of it though or if they were they were ignoring it so the very first paper that we published when we outlined what the trauma responses in journalists were i think the most telling statistic in that paper was that the journalists who had ptsd or depression or substance abuse were no more likely to be getting help than the journalists who never had it and so the, the, there was this great unmet clinical need that certain journalists were really hurting from this kind of work and they were not getting the help and then slowly through education and putting out data uh, the landscape has changed, and now, you know, 20 years on, many news organizations take this a lot more seriously than they did um, back when I started. Yeah, and they actually ask photojournalists, like, do you need help? There's a lot more happening, I would say. Sinbo, how are you seeing this in the newsroom? Certainly, I think there's been a, a much broader understanding of these issues within the mainstream media organizations that I've worked for or that I'm familiar with all have... Uh, systems in place to support their journalists through these kinds of issues and are very open to discussions about it. There is no longer the sense that you would be punished for asking for any kind of help. In fact, it's often offered even before and editors that I work with are very good at checking in, whether it's after a particular day or a particular assignment or just in general. Uh, if you uh, decide that actually you don't want to do these kind, a specific kind of assignment anymore. That doesn't mean the work is going to dry up for you. And having that reassurance is is really important as a freelance journalist. But I think uh, certainly it doesn't have the stigma attached to it that it once did. And that is, I would say, in some in some part due to Anthony's work and and journalists being willing to to seek out the kind of help that they mm. need. Yeah, I would say being freelance is another layer, but I would love to get into one specific thing that has always interested me as a person, but also as a photojournalist. These stories that we are doing, wh why do people return back? Like Finbar, you've been in this field for so long. You have had uh, this depression. You could have also thought, okay, I'm calling it a day. I'm not going to photograph this anymore. But usually, especially with war photography, people keep going back, even though there is trauma. How would you explain that for yourself? This is uh, something that I addressed in the book that I wrote on this subject, Shooting Ghosts, that I co-wrote with a U.S. Marine who I met in Afghanistan. And uh, at the end of that book, or one of the last chapters that I wrote, I think I wrote something like, you know, there'll always be another war, uh, just not for me. Um, well, that turned out to not be the case. I, I continued to cover conflicts. And um, and I, at some points, I have considered walking away. And I, I did leave photography and photojournalism for a number of years, um, mid-career, thinking and debating whether this was something that I wanted to continue doing. And, and that was part of the feeling of disillusionment that I had around the work, my work, the industry. 
Um, but here I am, I'm back. So the question is then why? Why do journalists return to these things? Well, obviously journalists aren't seeking out traumatic subjects, but it's our job to cover major world events. And this includes things like crime, natural disasters, conflict, humanitarian crises, and, and social justice. We care about these issues and we want to use our skills to contribute something to the public understanding and discourse, right? And when we feel able to do that, there's a sense of meaning and purpose to what we do. And that sense of purpose is, is something that I think is very natural to seek. So yes, we can talk about adrenaline junkies and, and people who just want to you know bounce from, from one war to the next, but I, I don't think it's about that. It is about feeling a sense of purpose and meaning. And, and uh, I, I don't think at this stage of my career, I'm so naive to think that any picture that I take or story that I write will will change the course of history. There are probably a handful of photographs that have ever been taken that have shifted the course of a conflict. But what you can feel like is you're part of a team that is involved in contributing to the flow of information on an important subject. And when you're working for a major media outlet, you can feel like you're getting that information to a public and to people who are the decision makers who will ultimately determine and decide the course of those conflicts or issues around humanitarian crises, natural disasters, or social justice. So it's being part of the conversation and having something to contribute. At least that's the way that I'm inclined to view it at this stage of my career. And Anthony, is there a neurological explanation? So motivation is complex. You know, what Funbar just spoke about is absolutely right. It's his, it's his personal experience. He's lived it. Um, you know, that's got considerable validity. Um, but there are going to be people who, through their biological makeup, um, feel more comfortable doing adventurous things and the people who want a quieter life. And that drive for novelty, adventure, something new, uh, call it what you want, can be traced to your neurotransmitters and your genetics. So people who take more risks, who don't want the nine to five job, who want something different with new experiences will have a different configuration to neurotransmitters like dopamine and noradrenaline. And where does that come from? Well, this is heritable. In other words, in large part, it comes from one's genes, which can explain about two thirds of the heritability over here. And so you have this biological substrate that allows this person to feel more comfortable doing activities um, that are new, different, potentially risky, because that's where their biology is pulling them. Uh, there are going to be other people who want to stay home, who want the nine to five job, they want the hour for lunch, they want the kind of routine and the regularity because that's where they, they feel comfortable in terms of their biology. Now, it's not all reductionistic. You can't say it's all biological. So you're going to have certain individuals who want more adventurous lifestyle. So where would that adventure or lifestyle that has more novelty or something that's different, where does that take them? Well, that will depend on their skill set. So someone like Finbar, who's got you know great skills as a, as, as a camera person, as a photographer, you know, he'll gravitate towards using his skills in a way that fits in, in a way with his biology. The person who writes very well will end up, you know, becoming a, a player print reporter, for example. Um, but other people will go in different directions. You know, there's going to be a shared biological substrate. The high mountaineers, the alpinists will also have this kind of biological makeup. The individuals who, you know, who race fast cars, they're going to share a common biological substrate. What differentiates them is where's their particular skill set. In Finbar's case, it's being a great journalist, so he goes and does journalism. Other people will, you know, end up climbing Mount Everest. So you're going to have this kind of different biological makeup that determines to a degree how we lead our lives. People who don't stay in tune to their biology can end up being very, very unhappy. So you know, you can take someone who wants the cautious life, who wants the kind of you know regular routine, and through circumstances they're thrown into an occupation that's very different. They end up, you know, in the front lines of conflict, et cetera, and they can't stand it. They 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 will leave that very quickly because it's so at odds with their biological makeup. Conversely, if you take, you know, a frontline journalist and say, well, you know, we're going to change the nature of your journalism. You're going to come back home and you're going to, you know, report on, say, the royal the royal family or so, whatever. They 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 they, they don't want to do that because it's it's completely at odds with their drive. And so when you can marry your biological substrate with your with your skill set, then you can end up in this you know perfect spot for that person, which is in the case of journalists, people who could sustain the career over many years doing this remarkable work and still navigating these very difficult parts of the world. That doesn't mean 
you have immunity from fear or from trauma, of course not. It's a very different uh, biological construct. It just means that in terms of your motivation and the pathway that your career takes, you're steered in a certain direction by your biology. Sinbard, how do you feel that trauma affects your photography or your work? Well, I mean, first here, I think we have to think about, you know, when we're, we're talking about the effects of trauma on storytellers, we have to think about which stories to our storytellers we're referring to, right? So are we talking about international journalists with institutional support like myself, or are we talking about local journalists who may be living in an active war or disaster zone? And local journalists who are going to be affected in different ways than those of us who can come and go um, as our s assignments dictate. But generally speaking, trauma can cause us you know, this kind of stress and anxiety and depression and this sense of alienation and disillusionment that we've been alluding to here. If we're talking about how it changes maybe the style of work or what we try to capture, I think certainly my own photography has evolved over the years and my approach has evolved so that I'm trying to work. Yes, I do work along the front lines often, but you're looking for, I'm looking for deeper stories or stories that may seem tangential, but are very core to the conflicts that I cover. And that can be the economic implications. It can be the impact on civilians. And you, you start to look at the world in terms of the systems that are causing the conflicts, not just the thing that's in front of you. You try to look at the bigger picture. I think that makes your work uh, so much better. I mean, that's so important for me as a storyteller and, I, and also for you to tell the stories and to look for the reasoning behind certain conflicts, right? Instead of just photographing the conflict itself. Right. So it's not just in trauma that's informing the storytelling, but it's it's experience, it's it's understanding, you know, our own responses. And also you you also understand, you know, we we are probably oftentimes less traumatized than the people who we may be reporting on or documenting. So it'll give us um perhaps a much more humane and delicate way of interacting with the people who we are spending time with, who we're reporting on, whether it's inter interviewing or photographing survivors of sexual violence or of um, torture or these kinds of things, we learn how to engage with people who may have been through extremely different, difficult and traumatizing experiences. Exactly. And how does trauma affect makers like Finbar? I mean, neurologically. Well, you know, once again, you know, you can do this kind of work and you don't have to develop, you know, psychological difficulties. And so, you know, the brain is fine then. The brain's just, you know, working really well. But if, say, you develop a condition like post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a mental illness that which can bring people down very hard, then there are brain changes that are associated with a condition like that. Um, so, for example, when you've got something like PTSD, you're very stressed. You can have high levels of the stress uh, hormone cortisol. Um, high levels of cortisol over a long period are not good for the brain. That can lead to selective atrophy of certain parts of the brain. So, you know, we store memories in a part of the brain called the hippocampus. Well, the hippocampus is vulnerable to atrophy or shrinkage um, if there are high levels of cortisol for a long period of time. Um, the hippocampus is connected to other parts of the brain that regulate emotion, like the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex. And so these neural circuits can become dysfunctional when you have a condition like PTSD. Um, just this week, there was a report that came out, I think in Nature Neuroscience, implicating a part of the brain called the posterior cingulate as being very important in traumatic memories. And the posterior cingulate is part of the brain that's involved in like daydreaming and introspection. So people are starting to rethink the neural substrate for, for trauma. But what's very clear is that when you've got a significant disorder like PTSD, there will be both structural brain changes and functional. The structural means the anatomy can change through some selective atrophy of parts of the brain, and the functional changes at the networks that um, determine how we respond emotionally, how we think, those networks can be dysfunctional as well. The connections between the hippocampus and the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex can become dysfunctional. And then, as I said more recently, this really interesting finding of the posterior cingulate, which is part of the limbic and the emotional brain, that must also be disordered in people with PTSD. And Simba, what do you what do you do to kind of stay healthy mentally? So what's interesting is through my conversations with Anthony is that I've learned uh, a skill set that to me is just as valuable as any of the journalistic skills that I have for managing and dealing with my own mental health. And so 
there's no one thing. Uh, it's a toolbox that you dip into as needed. And so what, one of those things can be speaking to a therapist or a, pro a professional who can give you some kind of guidance. Another can be medication if you need it. Another thing is uh, having a stable, a stable home environment to return to. That's critical as well as having good social support, good uh, social relations with friends and people who you can discuss these things with. And then for me, um, I've also found uh, exercise to be one of the best ways of getting into the body. Um, some people like mindfulness or meditation, but you know, one of the things with either depression or anxiety is this notion that we we either ruminate on the past or we fret about a potential future, and we don't kind of live in the moment. And by engaging in exercise, you're you're kind of forced to be in your body and in the moment. And for me, cycling is the thing that I enjoy. I go for long bike rides. I cycle often, and I try to maintain a level of fitness as much as I can um, when I'm on assignments. And and I find the combination of these various management tools allow me to dip into them as needed uh, and keep a, keep a good balance and, and, and also having a stable relationship at home that I've had for the last 10 years. All of these things contribute to being able to maintain an equilibrium that at times in the past when I've struggled, I haven't been able to have. I just want to pick up on one thing that Finbar said because I think it's so important. The single biggest protective factor for frontline journalists in terms of their emotional health is a good relationship. If you've got a good relationship, it's a buffer to what you you know what you witness, um, and that data meshes very well with the findings from you know, the, the general population. You know, psychiatry has known this for decades that good relationships are good for us; they they nurture us, they protect them in terms of our mental health. Um, and so, for front you know frontline journalists, you see the same kind of thing, irrespective of where you are, across cultures, across different language groups, irrespective. This is a universal truth, and um, the, the problem with people who you know, who do frontline journalism is that they're away from home for many, many months during the year. And that can put a real strain on relationships. And, you know, if you come back to a home that is an unhappy home where relationships are not functional, um, that adds to the, the, the challenges that you face, as opposed to coming back to a supportive partner, supportive spouse, whatever, where you're going to have a fundamentally different uh, experience. Um, and so when you say, what can you do to look after your mental health? I say, nourish your relationships, you know. Don't put all your energy into your work, which can be very time-consuming and, and, and very meaningful to you. You've got to leave some of your energy for your relationships, because if you don't, your mental health can certainly suffer. So I have a side question to this. I'm wondering like, what to do if you start kind of feeling like you're drifting away from friendships or relationships um, in a way where you feel you don't understand each other? I'll just say one thing about this before. I think it would be interesting to hear what Anthony has to say about it, but certainly from my own experience, what I discovered is when I was feeling low and and not not well, uh, my natural instinct was to withdraw and to, to sort of turn inward. And what is the most important at that point is actually to do the opposite, to, to force yourself to engage with people because as we've we've just discussed, that social engagement is key to to that mental health and, and emotional health. So you feel vulnerable and and certainly you might feel out of place or disengaged from what's happening around you. But taking those other management uh, tools and try to, to, to employ them in ways that will bring you back to a less kind of negative cognition and, and feeling less alienated is something that will allow you to engage socially again. And that'll be part of what brings you back to a healthier state of mind, I would say. Yes, I, th I think that's right. And if you've got a good a good relationship, um, that helps you do that. So, Anthony, the thing I wanted to ask you when it when it comes to trauma, and also as photojournalists dealing with photographing people with trauma, like Finbar just mentioned, are there certain steps that are advised? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you don't want to make a difficult situation worse. Obviously, you've got to be very sensitive to the people you're reporting on and photographing. Um, as Finbar mentioned, you know, the the people that that, that he works with um, are often very traumatized. They're a lot more distressed than the you know the journalists, and so you've got to be very sensitive to that. You don't want to make difficult situations worse. You've got to respect the people that you're reporting on, and there are guidelines about how to do that. I think they're quite lengthy guidelines. The Dart Group, for example, have come up with some pointers about what journalists should do when they 
go into difficult situations like this so they don't traumatize people further by their work. But you do have to make a distinction between that and someone, for example, who's got post-traumatic stress disorder because, and I come back to PTSD, but you could refer to major depression or anxiety disorder. You know, these conditions have very real world consequences. Um, they're not abstractions. They're not just a label that you attach to someone. They come with significant downsides. Um, people who have the full-blown PTSD syndrome will struggle to work. Um, their judgment will be impaired. Um, their concentration is going to be off. They're not going to do justice to their skill. And they can be very difficult to be around. They will be in bureaus in which other people will notice their behavior has changed and they can be uncomfortable to be with. They can, you know, they, they can become avoidant. They can become reckless in their decision making. And I've come across this repeatedly that, you know, journalists who are traumatized and they're in a bureau and the bureau is in a war zone, um, they become a threat to their colleagues because their judgment is off. They're making bad decisions. And so one has to be very careful. You can't in any way <clears throat> attach anything glamorous to the notion of, of PTSD or being traumatized. It is a very tough, very difficult mental illness that will have negative consequences, not just for the journalists, but often for people in their, in their immediate orbit. Have you been in situations like that, Fimba, where you've worked in the field and you've realized, oh, this this colleague or this person, and this is not working. Some people that I've come across during the course of my career have, have struggled with these things and have had certainly at least patches where their judgment was not at its best, and that can have knock-on effects and repercussions for those around them, certainly. So yeah, it's, it's certainly something to be aware of. Um, and I think one of the responsibilities we also have as journalists is to keep an eye out for our colleagues and and be able to speak to them and say, hey, maybe you need to take a little bit of a break or you're pushing a little hard on this now. Um, maybe we just need to take a step back and 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 reconsider what we're doing in this particular context. And how, how have you seen that change? Like, how have you found support within our community? Yeah, in my case, I... I I took a, a couple of years off. I did a, a sabbatical year where I did some research around trauma and psychology and trying to understand what, what it was and get a better grasp of it. And I work with organizations like the ACOS Alliance, which is a culture of safety alliance, which is geared towards the safety of journalists and um, particularly freelancers and local journalists operating around the world. And they do offer not only hostile environment training, but also uh, psychological support, as does as do organizations like uh, the Rory Peck Trust. So there are some institutions out there who offer um, support for freelance journalists who may not be able to afford some of the kind of professional help that we would like to, especially in places where they may not have the kind of medical insurance that would cover these costs. So there are organizations that exist. A lot of the institutions that we work for, even as freelancers, will offer the kind of support that Anthony provides. And so it's a question of asking employers or people who commission us for our work to to get that kind of support. And do you sometimes also ask colleagues in the field like, hey, how are you feeling? Or is our industry not really there like yet in that sense? Well, I think those kinds of conversations when people are under stress, it's not, hey, let's talk about the stress or any kind of post-traumatic stress if it, if it is that. It's more specific to be say, hey, you know, we're all under stress. We had a bit of a disagreement, or you, somebody had a disagreement with somebody else in the team this morning. How about we just sit down and hash it all out and, and figure it out? So it doesn't have to necessarily be about the bigger picture. Sometimes when you're in the in the moment of an assignment, you just need to address the specific issue of the day, and then the bigger picture can be addressed or um, treated at a later point. So. I, t I find that the bigger conversations about emotional health tend to happen when we're not in the field. Yes, you can say, hey, are you okay after this experience this morning or this afternoon if you've come under fire or attack or assault or something? Hey, are you feeling a bit shaky? Do we need to just kind of take a minute to to just check in? That's that's absolutely fine. But I think the the impact of these kinds of stresses tends to be much more in terms of personal dynamics between team members on, on assignments. Um, you know, anger or frustration can can be vented. It's about managing these kind of personal relationships in the moment. Uh, then the bigger conversations around, hey, how are you doing? Do you need to take a break from this kind of work for a while? 
those happen when we're back at home. <laughs> at this point, because of the work that I've done on it quite publicly, you know, colleagues may ask if they can have a chat about something with me, and I'm very, I'm always very open to doing that. And as Anthony did with me initially, it's about validating that experience, saying it's totally normal, it's good that you're asking. Here's a couple of things that have worked for me, but I'm not a clinician, so I'd always say like, hey, get the get the kind of professional support that you would need. And then you send people to Anthony. Well, he, yeah, but not everybody. I don't think Anthony can take on everybody. I can't. No. <laughs> I give him bar. <laughs> and Anthony, for young photographers who might be listening to this podcast, uh, I know there's lots of students listening. What would be your advice um, for people starting out And I would say there's a lot of young photographers who go to these kind of war zones unprepared. Uh, I think Finbar has seen several of them during his work as well. So, so you know, my, my advice is confined to the area that I feel I've got knowledge, which is mental health. I'll never tell a person what to do with their career, um, far from it. But certainly when it comes to mental health, I'm a big advocate for education. So I would say educate yourself about what are the psychological risks that come with work like this. Just become familiar with you know, good mental health. So the kind of discussion that we're having today, I think, is so important because this starts informing people. People start becoming aware of what are the psychological challenges that you will confront, what are the symptoms that you might display. And through knowledge, you're empowered. And when you're, you know, when you're more knowledgeable about something, you're going to be in a better position to do something about it. And so having a discussion like this take some of the stigma out of the topic. It tends to normalize a lot of what the discussion to, should be. And, you know, when you get a well-known journalist like Finbot talking about it, it's such a powerful role model for young people as well. When I look back, when I started my work 20 years back, what 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 shifted the needle was that you know, some big name journalist stood up and said, hey, this is really important. And when the profession hears it from their own, they are much more likely to to believe it and, and take it seriously. So to have role models like Finbar, I think, is absolutely crucial and important. And so it all boils down to education. Just educate yourself about what the risks are and be aware that whatever you feel emotionally is potentially treatable. I would absolutely agree with everything Anthony's just said because I remember when I was um, feeling distressed and uh, went to see Anthony and we had our conversation And I began to understand and, and realize what he was talking about and what this meant. I remember walking out of that office after 45 minutes or an hour. Again, there's no silver bullet that cures how we may be feeling, but I, I felt like I kind of skipped across the parking lot as I left because I was I had the knowledge that allowed me to understand some of the experiences and the way I was feeling. And that's also what inspired me to go on and do further research to get my head around um, some of the, the, the psychology of, of this as well. But through doing that, I've allowed, I've been able to understand and feel comfortable with a lot of these issues and a lot of these, um, these things that we're talking about today. And, and that I've found has been extremely helpful. And so I would encourage people to ask about what what this is, what it means, how to deal with it, and speak openly about it. Because there isn't and shouldn't be as much shame attached to it as there has been in the past. This is like breaking your arm. How do you fix it? How do you manage it? And how do you move forward and, and continue to do the kind of things um, and work that you want to do? Yeah, I, I really want to thank you for being so open, uh, Finbar and Anthony, for all the things that you've shared. And I hope this yeah photographers and filmmakers listening now realizing that what they might be feeling is actually normal and that they can seek help thank you so much for all of this yeah thank you thank you Obi. you've been listening to shutter stories a canon podcast thanks to my guest finbar o'reilly and dr anthony feinstein and of course to you for listening as mentioned at the top this conversation may have been triggering for you and there are lots of organizations offering support to people working in our industry. Details of the ones Finbar and Anthony mentioned are in the show notes. Please come back next month for another episode. And in the meantime, don't be a stranger. There are loads of brilliant ways to stay in contact with us in the show notes. And we would really love to hear your feedback. So rate the show five stars on the platform you listen on and spread the word with all your favorite photographers, filmmakers and content creators. Until next time. Shutter Stories, a Canon podcast.